minutes tonight here on BBC One, we continue the epic Indian tale Mahabharat. First, Patrick Moore is your guide to the sky at night. Good evening. 1990 has been quite an eventful year. In particular, we've had the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. We all know that the mirror isn't perfect, but all the same, it is sending back superb pictures. Look, for example, at the ninth planet, Pluto. There on the left is the best ground-based telescope view of Pluto and its satellite, Charon. And there on the right is the view obtained with the faint object camera of the Hubble Telescope. And the two, as you can see, are clearly separated for the first time. Of course, um, no surface detail shown, but then Pluto is very small and a long way away. And also, it's rather a cold world, temperature something like minus 420 Fahrenheit. We also had a very unusual bright white spot on the surface of Saturn. It was discovered in October, and a few nights after the discovery, I had my first good view of it, and there is my drawing, made by my 15-inch telescope. You can see the white spot there to the um, upper right between the ring and the main dark belt, and it's due to an uprush of gas coming from inside Saturn. Well, that was October the 8th. Um, a week later, the spot was photographed with the NTT, or New Technology Telescope, at La Silla in Chile, and there you can see it very clearly. Now, as time went by, the spot spread out and became more elongated. And then, in November, this lovely picture was taken of it with the Hubble telescope. It's a false colour picture, of course. The lower clouds are in blue, the upper clouds are in red. And you can see that the spot has spread out and really ceased to be a spot. And what's going to happen? Well, we're not sure. At the moment, Saturn is more or less unobservable. It's almost behind the sun. And it will just got to wait and see what happens when it reappears in the dawn sky. Now, the Hubble is not the only telescope in space at the moment. The Astro Telescope was launched a little while ago. And then, last summer, up went ROSAT. Now, ROSAT is a very special kind of telescope. And at this stage, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Ken Pounds, Professor of Space Physics at the University of Leicester, and also President of the Royal Astronomical Society. Ken, welcome to the sky at night. First of all, why is ROSAT called a ROSAT? ROSAT is shorthand for Röntgen Satellite, which, of course, in English is X-ray satellite. And Röntgen was the German scientist who discovered X-rays in the late 19th century. It's, in, in that sense, quite appropriate. It is primarily a German mission, although the British involvement is substantial. And it was launched on schedule. Went up on the 1st of June from Kennedy Space Two, Center. One. On a... We have ignition. Delta II lift rocket. Off. Lift off of Delta 195 and the Rosat spacecraft. An unmanned launch, needless to say. Yes, we see here the main engine, which continues to burn for about four minutes. Strapped to the side of the main engine are six solid booster rockets, which um, fall off after about a minute into flight. What experiments does Rosat carry? Two main telescopes. The German X-ray telescope sits in the middle of the spacecraft, uh, and that is the largest and most um, and highest resolution X-ray telescope ever flown. Sitting below that, uh, rather more modest, but nevertheless uh, quite significant, is the British Widefield Camera. This was put together by a consortium of university groups, University College uh, and Imperial College in London, Birmingham University, ours at Leicester, and the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. And this works in a new part of the spectrum, the so-called extreme ultraviolet. How does it operate? Both telescopes operate in a rather different way to conventional telescopes in that they have two mirrors, rather like a Cassegrain system. But the mirrors are inclined in such a way that the radiation hits the mirrors at grazing incidence at around two degrees to the plane of the, of the mirror. This is required in order that the X-rays or the ultraviolet are reflected with good efficiency. Why is it that this particular part of the spectrum hasn't been closely examined before? Yeah. Well, it is a murky area of the spectrum sitting between X-rays and ultraviolet. And the predictions of astronomers before about 1970 
were that this would be a, a region that would be unaccessible from the solar system. In other words, shorter than ultraviolet and longer than X-rays. That's right. And the reason why it was thought to be a particularly difficult reason, region to work in is because it is the region where hydrogen and helium are very absorbing. And of course, the galaxy contains primarily these two gases. Uh, so the expectation was that the solar system would be surrounded by a curtain which would really obscure the rest of the universe from our sight and this curtain would be so close as to make it really not worth having a go. But this wasn't true. That's right. There were observations carried out from a number of ultraviolet satellites, Copernicus for instance, the early days of IUE in the 1970s, taking observations on distant stars, measuring the amount of material in the line of sight to the star, from which it became clear that the interstellar medium, in fact, was very patchy. And here we have sun in the middle and the interstellar medium around it. So we can see from here, in fact, that the curtain that I've previously referred to of cold hydrogen that prevents us seeing in the Milky Way uh, too far, in fact, is, by f is, is, is in no way symmetrical around the sun. So the, the white line, for instance, represents the, the distance in di given directions where the hydrogen starts to become a problem the pink, it's a severe problem, and the red is more or less like a brick wall. You just can't see beyond it. So, in other words, in the direction of Cygnus in the Milky Way, we have problems still. But in other directions, Centaurus and Canis Major in particular, we would expect to be able to see to quite long distances, maybe even right outside the galaxy. Distances they are given in parsecs, one parsec being about three and a quarter light years. Right. Well, obviously, the first thing to do was to carry out a complete survey of the sky at these particular wavelengths. How is that going? Well, that's going fine. That began on the um, 30th of July and will extend until the beginning of February. So we're now just over halfway through. Uh, we've already discovered a large number of bright sources. Uh, we, sh we see here uh, a map that represents the position as of about mid-November. The blue part of the sky shows the uh, region covered up to that time. The yellow dots show the bright sources that were obvious from examining just a, a fraction of the data uh, at our Quick Look facility in Germany. Any bright stars among those? Some of the uh, yellow dots, in fact, are associated with, with quite well-known objects uh, that are visible uh, on a dark night with the naked eye. For instance, uh, one of them is the well-known uh, binary system Algol, second magnitude object. It's not obvious why that should show up so brightly uh, uh, in the XUV because there are uh, two fairly normal stars going around one another in that, in that system. More obvious is maybe why Procyon shows up. Procyon we see there down near the equator. Another bright object in the visible, of course, but one of the companion stars is a white dwarf, and the white dwarf is a likely candidate for XUV emission. Similarly, Sirius, of course, the brightest visible object, visible star in the sky, other than the sun, of course, uh, another binary system with a white dwarf. So a few obvious things are showing up, but more interesting to us are the uh, identifications of the sources that are not obvious. Such as the first one you ever discovered? Yes, indeed. The very first source that we saw on our first look at the sky back in mid-June. Uh, the image of that uh, was of great interest to us because uh, it's obviously a fairly nail-biting moment to open the shutter, switch the high voltages on and, and see what you see. We were happy to see a flat field, fairly low background, um, and as a bonus, a bright new source sitting over there on the right-hand side. This we call WFC1, uh, though it wasn't obvious what it was because there were no obvious um, stars nearby that, that are likely to be XUV sources. So it was a detection, but not at that time an identification. Well, the first thing to do, presumably, was to identify it, if you could. To follow it up, in fact, and this then represented the first example of the sort of detective trail that I imagine will be followed hundreds and thousands of times as, as we go through the mission. The first thing to do was to locate it as accurately as we could. This we did uh, to an accuracy of about an arc minute. So we see here a superposition of the one arc minute error circle on the night sky background, and the yellow dots are normal stars, some of them quite faint, down to about 15th magnitude. The only star that's 
anywhere near the XUV error circle is the yellow one on the right hand side. So that looked like an interesting candidate. In fact, more than interesting because it was very blue. So it was a 13th magnitude, extremely blue star, well worth following up with ground-based telescopes. So, um, if I remember rightly, what you did was to contact the William Herschel telescope on La Palma and um, talk about getting spectra. Yes, we did, and fortunately, Phil Charles, who's a colleague of ours, was working there at the time and spent three nights looking at our object, producing some very interesting spectra that I think did solve at least this particular problem. What did they tell you? The first spectrum, the blue, shows a very characteristic spectrum of a white dwarf star because what we've got there is a strong hot continuum and absorption lines. Those dips represent well-known absorption features of hydrogen and hydrogen is likely to be the main constituent of many dwarf star atmospheres and so what we're seeing there we think is the hot atmosphere with a layer of hydrogen that's absorbing some of the XUV rate, some of the light that, as it comes out. But there were some other features that were not so obvious. Uh, for instance, calcium K in emission. Now that's not something you'd expect to see from a white dwarf star. So moving on to the red spectrum, we now see other features that I think help to explain what's going on. Sodium D, for instance, in absorption. Again, not something you'd see from a white dwarf star. And then in the center of the H alpha absorption core, a bright emission feature which is again likely to suggest or seems to suggest that there is something else in the system besides the white dwarf. What we now believe is that we're looking at a very interesting close binary pair of stars. The one on the right there is the blue is the white dwarf from which we think we're getting the ROSAT XUV emission but it's close enough to be producing substantial secondary light from the red dwarf on the left. And so some of the other features, I think, are almost certainly arising from the red dwarf. So it's a very interesting binary system that the first observation from Rosat has sort of pointed us in the direction of. It's certainly an exciting star. What about other curious binary systems? I'm thinking, of course, here of these stars that seem to be covered with spots. Well, one of the, uh, some of the sources we look at are variable. They change from hour to hour and day to day. And we can, given the particular way in which the the survey is carried out, look at stars, look at anything in the sky for anything from five days up to the whole duration, duration of the mission, depending on the ecliptic latitude. One of the sources that we looked at for uh, several, two, two or three weeks at the end of October was BY Draconis. BY Draconis is a binary system, again, but with one of the components being an extremely spotty star, the one on the right here, is the spotty star. It's a red dwarf with a possibly 30% of its surface covered in spots, so far more spotty than our sun is, for instance, now near its peak activity in 1990. And what we're seeing uh, from uh, this particular object with, uh, with ROSAT are two, two features. One is obvious. One, we're seeing uh, a number of strong flares. This particular section of data shows two, two strong flares in the center which represent uh, considerably greater luminosity than, than we'd ever get from the sun uh, in, in, th in this wave band. But then there's a hint already, and this is only still a fraction of the data, a hint already of the 3.8 day rotation period of the spotty star. The arrows pick out there, looking from the right, there is a peak underneath the arrow, and as you move leftwards you see that there is some correlation between the arrows and the peaks. I think what that is probably showing us is the rotation of the spotty star with more spots on one side than on the other. So we're actually seeing a modulation in the XUV emission. And then, of course, there is the Vela supernova remnant. All that's left of the star that blew up many thousands of years ago and destroyed itself. And uh, in optical light, as in that picture taken from Australia, it's spectacular enough. But I think it's even more interesting, if possible, in XUV. Yes, one of the reasons why supernova remnants are particularly interesting to us with ROSAT is that <clears throat> although they are, as you say, spectacular objects in the visible, uh, one would expect that most of the energy from a supernova remnant of that age, that one's about 15,000 years old, will still be in the form of very hot gas, around a million degrees, which should be radiating primarily in the XUV.
So although it's a long way away, 1,500 light years, it is in one of the advantageous directions. So we were hopeful we might see Vela, and it turns out we are. What we see here is, again, just a fraction of the data from the Quick Look facility in which we see some strong loops of emission. Um, this is a, a, a false color image, of course, and the bright XUV radiation is shown in green against the darker blue background. Uh, as we build up this picture, I imagine this will turn out to be a really fascinating picture of this uh, relatively old supernova remnant. So far, we've been mm. talking about objects in our own particular Milky Way galaxy. What about looking beyond our galaxy? Can you do that at these particular wavelengths? That was something we couldn't predict before launch, and we, we always thought that um, extragalactic astronomy would be a bonus if we saw anything. Um, happily, we are getting this bonus, and we've already seen several extragalactic objects. My bet as to what we might see were quasars, because quasars are extremely luminous, and they do contain strong, soft X-ray emission. Um, what did turn up first was something quite different. We saw emission from a cluster of galaxies. Uh, this is a particularly interesting cluster. It's uh, quite a long way away, about 600 million light years. It consists of several hundred galaxies, and you can see a few of them on this Palomar sky plate. But it's got a dominant CD galaxy at the center. It's called NGC 6166, and it's a giant galaxy, probably about uh, five times larger than our, our own spiral galaxy. Now, the interesting thing with, for us is that we see that with the wide field camera, w and we see it not, a, not just as a, an XUV source, but as an extended XUV source. And this is an image that we've just produced of this central region of the cluster, in which you can see on the scale on the left that the extent of the bright emission shown here in yellow is about a third of a degree. And that's centered on this giant central galaxy. What we believe it is, is a picture basically of the hot gas that is being, that is falling onto this central galaxy from the larger cluster. And of course, the amount of material that's involved may well be as much as 200 solar masses a year. If you then integrate that over the lifetime of the cluster, that could in itself be responsible for the size of the central galaxy. In other words, it's being continually fed, apparently, by this material falling in from the outer parts of the cluster. So we're quite excited by this first extragalactic observation. Well, obviously, you're getting back a tremendous amount of information. How long do you think that Rosette is going to go on operating? Months or years? The orbit should certainly allow us to operate for at least five years, maybe more. And, and by the way, just as an aside for uh, observers looking from their back gardens, as it were, we, it is a third magnitude object that goes over Britain every night, uh, sometimes at better times that, than others for observing, but it can be seen. But it, in terms of its uh, main mission, we would be hopeful that perhaps it could operate for four or five years. There's nothing on the wide field camera uh, that should be used up. So we, we're quite optimistic about a long run for ROSAT. Well, certainly ROSAT has already proved itself to be a real success and is going to send back a great deal more information in the years to come. Ken, thank you very much. Thank you. So we look forward now to 1991. And um, since this is my last broadcast of the, present, of the present year, may I wish you all a very happy Christmas and New Year. And um, if you're going to London to see the illuminations, do go around the Carnaby Street area. And there you will see a display representing the solar system designed by Sky at Night viewer Mark Bernard. And so, until uh, 1991, good night. <laughs>